Hello, everyone. Uh, welcome, welcome. I'm Charlotte Gibson, president of the Charlottesville chapter of the National Organization for Women. We're so glad you're joining us tonight for our Women's History Month program, The Pleasures of Age. Please be aware that tonight's meeting is being recorded and will be posted afterward on Charlottesville Now's YouTube channel. You can find the link for that in the chat. Tonight, <clears throat> we are fortunate and thrilled to have as our speaker, Corinne Field, Associate Professor, Professor of Women, Gender and Sexuality at the University of Virginia. She has held multiple fellowships and in 2018, 2019, was the inaugural Mellon Schlesinger Fellow at the Radcliffe Institute for Advanced Study at Harvard University. Professor Fields' research focuses on the intersections of age, gender, and race in US history, focusing in particular on the political dimensions of chronolog chronological age in debates over women's rights and racial justice. She is the author of The Struggle for Equal Adulthood, Gender, Race, and the Fight for Citizenship in Antebellum America, and co editor of Age in America, Colonial Era to the Present. You can find links to these books in the chat tonight. Professor Field's current book project is entitled Grand Old Women and Modern Girls, Age, Race and Power in the US Women's Rights Movement, 1870 to 1920. If you have questions during the program, please type them in the chat as they occur to you and Professor Field will address them during the Q&A after she finishes speaking. Thank you, thank you, Professor Field, for being here tonight. The Zoom floor is yours. Oh, thank you so much, Charlotte, for that lovely introduction and for inviting me to speak to all of you. And thank you for showing up uh, on tonight. And also just thank you to now for everything that you do for women. I really appreciate all of you and I'm just delighted to be here to talk. Um, I'm going to share my screen and hopefully this is all going to work without a glitch. Um, Okay, you can all see that and hear me? Yes. Okay, wonderful. So um, tonight, as Charlotte said, I wanna to talk to you about old women and political power in the US women's suffrage movement. So with this 100 year celebration of the 19th amendment, um, you've probably been hearing and thinking about women suffragists, but what is important to realize about that movement is that they fought for so much more than the vote. I mean, I think of women suffragists in the 19th century as a precursor to now in that they thought very expansively about women's rights, women's freedom, their bodily self-control. And one aspect that's been underappreciated that they thought about a lot was growing old and what it meant for women to grow old in public as national political leaders of the women's suffrage movement, and also what age meant for gender and racial equality in the United States. Uh, so what I wanna focus in particular on tonight is these um, strategies that they came up with for empowering themselves as they grew older and also their thinking around age. And my argument is that 19th century women suffragists devoted a remarkable amount of attention to old women and old age. So from the 1830s, when anti-slavery activists first began to claim a public voice for women, through the final push for women suffrage in the 1910s, influential suffragists argued that women would never achieve political power in democratic governments unless ordinary citizens stopped denigrating and patronizing older women and instead recognized gray hair and wrinkles as signs of competence, authority, and charisma. To convince Americans that older women belonged in positions of political power, suffragists pushed older women to the forefront of their organizations, created and circulated positive images of older leaders, such as this studio portrait, which was, um, that can you, you can all see the text, right? Because on the side, Charlotte, I hope so. Okay, because I do have some text here that shows you the ages of these women. But so this was a posed studio portrait of three very well-known suffrage leaders. And um, it shows how they expressed this camaraderie and joy 
and empowerment as they grew older. And they also um, made a theoretical argument that it's at its most simple can be summarized as the argument that if men retained, that men were able to retain political power in part by sexualizing young girls and then ridiculing older women, and that this would have to change if women were to be equal. So today, Susan B. Anthony is the best known woman suffragist. Uh, she rose to national prominence after the Civil War when she was in her 50s and achieved her greatest influence in her 70s, remained very active through her 80s. But she was not alone. So when you think of the most famous suffrage leaders from the late 19th century, they were all middle-aged or older when they achieved their greatest influence. So women like Lucretia Mott, Sojourner Truth, Susan B. Anthony, Frances Harper, Elizabeth Cady Stanton, and Kara Chapman Catt were all older women in the public eye. Now, younger women were very active in the suffrage movement, building organizations, collaborating closely with their elders, but the women that they elevated to national prominence were all old. And I wanna argue that they did this for a political reason. So women suffragists wanted not just to vote, but also to be voted for. They wanted to put women in state houses, in Congress, and in the White House. And they saw that the higher the political office, the more likely its occupant was to be old. Now, the Constitution specifies that the President of the United States must be at least 35 years old. But in practice, Americans tend to elect men much older than that, usually in their 50s or 60s, and often in their 70s. In 1900, when Susan B. Anthony was at the height of her fame, a man under 45 had never been elected president. Americans worshiped white-haired George Washington as the father of the country, celebrating his birthday every February. Anthony also happened to have a February birthday. And starting in 1870, when she turned 50 years old, suffragists began turning her birthday into an annual event. In 1900, women suffragists throughout the nation gathered to celebrate Anthony's birthday, hailing her as the quote, George Washington of the woman suffrage movement. This promotion of Anthony was an effort to convince Americans, not just that women should vote for president, but that a woman should be president. And as you know, we still aren't there yet, though we just got a step closer with Kamala Harris in the vice president position. But tonight, what I want to emphasize is that this campaign to empower older women is uh, important and fascinating and worth knowing about, but that it also largely failed. And that it failed, I think, for three significant reasons. So first, the very tenacity of the fear, ridicule, and disgust for older women in our culture, mobilized largely by men in positions of cultural and political power. But second, and of equal significance, women's own fears about growing older and young women's desires to liberate themselves from their elders. And third, the tendency of propertied, educated women, mostly but not exclusively white, to focus on their own empowerment in later life, while often extracting labor and resources from other women who were poorer, darker skinned, or less educated than themselves. So these divisions of gender, age, and race worked in ways that continued to undermine the authority of older women, rendering them ridiculous and suggesting that they had no place in politics. So first, let me say something about what I mean by old. So according to women's rights activists, the category old functioned not as a measure of chronological age per se, but as a means of ridiculing and reproaching women whom people no longer found attractive. So at the first National Women's Rights Convention, which was held in Worcester, Mass. in 1850, this is two years after the local convention that was held at Seneca Falls. So in 1850, Lucretia Mott laid out many demands for women's rights. But one of the things that she said was, quote, a woman has nothing but her outward semblance in her favor. When that ceases, all respect for her vanishes. For an old woman is simply an object of ridicule, and anything that is ridiculous or foolish is said to be only fit for an old woman. So this idea that Americans tended to ridicule old women and ridicule uh, things that they did not support as old women was baked into the women's rights agenda from the very start. 
20 years later, Matilda Jocelyn Gage said that a woman is held by the world as a toy and a slave. A woman's value is like that of such articles. Um, I just need to figure out how to hide. Okay. Um, sorry, forgive me. This is misbehaving. Okay. Held by the world as a toy and a slave, a woman's value, like that of such articles, has been only in her youth and good looks. Loved and prized for her beauty alone, her intellect and her soul have been passed aside as dross, and no terms of reproach has equaled those of old woman, old maid. So you see this way of thinking about old age in this movement in the 19th century. And what I want to really have you understand is that in letters, diaries, and novels, people generally defined age 30 as the moment when an unmarried woman became an old maid, age 30. So old as a term of ridicule and reproach did not always mean old in terms of chronological years. Oldness, these women argued, was a political and a cultural category, not a matter of birthdays or biology. And this meant that they could change what it meant for women to grow old. And I want to spell out some of the ways that they did that, focusing first on the theoretical insights and political strategies developed by Black women, such as Sojourner Truth and Harriet Tubman. So if you look again at Gage's argument here, I want you to notice how Gage references slavery in this quote without talking about the specific struggles of Black women trying to build lives after emancipation. This is quite typical of the failures of educated propertied white women who treated slavery as a metaphor for their own experience. And I think we should recognize this for what it is, which is a form of racism. But if we simply focus on Gage's racism, we can lose sight of the ways in which she learned about the age dynamics of slavery from Black women themselves. So Black women were among the first to define age as a political issue essential to women's liberation. So at that first National Women's Rights Convention in Worcester, Mott closed the event by echoing the words of Sojourner Truth, a self-liberated former slave born in upstate New York. Truth had delivered a long speech defining anti-slavery and women's rights as part of God's unfolding plan for human progress, and Mott found in it one of the most effective speeches of the convention. One of Truth's main points um, in her narrative uh, of her life, which she was selling at that convention, was about age. She argued that enslavers, and remember she was enslaved in the North, exploited the productive and reproductive potential of young people, wearing out their bodies prematurely, and then once they could no longer work, left them to die of neglect in old age. So Truth's first enslaver, an old white man, provided for his white children's future by rendering her own family heritable property, destroying her parents' ability to raise her and her own ability to care for them as they aged. Slavery in Truth's analysis was a system that rendered older Black people disposable, even as it made white families wealthy. As Truth lectured at women's rights and anti-slavery conventions, she insisted that white Northerners owed material support to people like herself who had spent their youth in slavery, their productive and reproductive capacity benefiting enslavers without any ability to plan for their own security in later life. In 1870, in the midst of Reconstruction, Truth began circulating a petition that read, quote, to the Senate and House of Representatives in Congress assembled, we, the undersigned, therefore, earnestly request your honorable body to set apart for freed people a portion of public land in the West and erect buildings thereon for the aged and infirm and otherwise legislate so as to secure the desired results. So Truth argued that the government owed enslaved people support, not out of charity, but because of a debt that had not yet been paid. As she explained in the 1870 edition of her narrative, we, meaning the enslaved people, have been a source of wealth to this republic, earning millions of money. Our unpaid labor has been a stepping stone to its financial success. Some of its dividends must surely be ours. When Congress refused to act on her plan, Truth regretted now as ever that, quote, woman had no political rights under government. So what Truth is doing is theorizing 
racial justice in terms of old age justice, in terms of what the nation owed to people who had spent their youth in slavery. Harriet Tubman also regarded material support in old age as essential to the rights and freedom of black women. So some of you may have seen the movie Harriet that came out recently, and if you haven't, I recommend it, it's terrific. But that movie ends after the Civil War when Tubman reunites with her parents in Auburn, New York. And then brief titles mention that she went on to advocate for freed people, women's rights, and old people. Well, that segment of her life is almost as uh, long as the underground railroad segment. Um, in fact, she founded a home for age free people on her property in Auburn, New York, and spent much of her later life fundraising for this institution. Her efforts to provide for her own parents led her to make a broader argument that young people, black and white, owed aging freed people material support. So she, like Truth, saw women's right to vote as a means for securing economic justice, particularly for older people. Now, Lucretia Mott continued to work with both Truth and Tubman after the Civil War. Mott's sister lived near Tubman in Auburn, and Truth and Mott frequently crossed paths on the lecture circuit. Maude agreed with Truth and Tubman that white families, even if they had not directly owned enslaved people, owed financial support to formerly enslaved people. She supported, Mott did, the Philadelphia Home for Aged and Infirm Colored People, urging white people to donate to this institution as, quote, but a small return for the wrongs done to the colored people, end quote. So both Mott and Truth remained politically active into their 80s. As they grew older, Mott and Truth posed for numerous photographs that they distributed and sold to supporters. They both adopted a simple style of Quaker dress and struck poses that radiated competence and wisdom. I think we need to read these images as an effort to show Americans what older women leaders could look like, and I argue that we need to recognize this as an interracial strategy that cut across the color line. Many white suffragists did turn their backs on black women after the Civil War. Of these, Elizabeth Cady Stanton has probably become the most notorious. But even as Stanton focused on the needs of educated white women like herself, she took up the argument that white men exploited young girls and then discarded older women. This was a logic also articulated by black women, though Stanton downplayed the significance of race and set herself the task of convincing white women to celebrate growing older. Stanton's central insight was that women themselves needed to be convinced to value old age, to look forward to later life as a time of ongoing development and potential empowerment, rather than just a loss of beauty and reproductive potential. On the occasion of her 70th birthday, she gave a speech on, quote, the pleasures of age that later circulated widely as a pamphlet. Quote, I often hear women say after their children are grown up and established in life that they have nothing to live for. I would point them to the broad fields of philanthropic work, to the wants and needs of humanity. Yes, they say, I might have done something years ago, but I am too old to begin now. Not so, 50, not 15, is the heyday of a woman's life. Suffragists around the country turned Stanton's birthday into a major event. Women suffragists also staged large public birthday celebrations for Susan B. Anthony, Mary Livermore, and Julia Ward Howe. These events celebrated old women as active and involved political leaders while acknowledging that old age might bring physical and mental struggles, declining mobility, failing eyesight, aches and pains, these celebrations emphasized political wisdom and strategic skill gained over years of activism. They presented women in short as political authorities, as national leaders that should not only vote, but be voted for. And they also allowed women to say out loud how old they were each year and celebrate that fact. 
And yet, even as suffragists black and white poured all this energy into redefining old age, many Americans continued to use the label old as a way to denigrate women, both old maids and old women. So remember that 1850 convention where Mott theorized the term old as a form of ridicule? Well, as if to prove her point, the New York Herald described the convention as, quote, the incantation of old women, the infidel abolitionists and the fugitive slaves. The correspondent signaled out both Mott and truth for ridicule in particular. Indeed, anti-abolitionists in the 1830s and 40s mobilized two tropes, what they called racial amalgamation, which meant interracial marriage, and the supposed unattractiveness of old women. So both tropes were often combined as in this political cartoon that shows John Quincy Adams introducing the Haitian ambassador who's a made up racist caricature to the ladies of Lynn, who were actually uh, very real, the Lynn Anti-Slavery Society. The old woman in front says, quote, enchanted to make your acquaintance, uh, end quote. The humor here is that she's acting like a young coquette, but her white hair, lace bonnet and wrinkles mark her as old and unattractive. So the artist Henry Clay dedicated the cartoon to Caroline Chase, president of the Lynn Female Anti-Slavery Society. Her real name was Aeroline. Uh, he put on the C to avoid uh, libel. <laughs> um, she was 32 years old at the time. So this ridiculing of women as old was a made up critique and a way of mobilizing age against the anti-slavery activists. Now, some of them were actually quite old, but not the woman he dedicated this cartoon to. Now, portraying male politicians as old women was also a staple of political cartooning in the 19th century. So here, Benjamin Harrison drives Martin Van Buren away with a broom. Don't worry about the party politics, but look at the representation of uh, Harrison as an old woman. Uh, 50 years later, in the 1890s, the illustrated magazine Puck pictured anti-imperialists as busy old women undermining national strength. And in the 1890s, illustrated magazines are just full of uh, images like this, making fun of men by turning them into old women. Political cartoons were not the only vehicle for poking fun at older women. In February each year, people often sent nasty cards known as vinegar valentines as a kind of practical joke. So this started because the recipient of mail paid the postage in the 19th century. So you not only got a nasty valentine, you had to pay for it. Uh, but poking fun at unattractive old maids um, who wanted to act like men was a comic staple in the period. And so this is the old trope of the hen who wants to crow, which is also how people made fun of um, women's rights activists as hens who wanted to crow. But here it's pointing out that they're aged maidens in particular. Now, 19th century humor was viciously degrading to many social groups, not just old white women, um, but old women came in for particular nas particularly nasty caricatures. And these negative stereotypes came in seemingly more benign forms as well. So I imagine many of you have played the children's card game, Old Maid. It's still with us. I played it with my kids. So, you know, the premise of that is teaching children to avoid the one old maid card, which they're going to lose if they have. And um, there's this fascinating card deck I found at the American Antiquarian Society from the 1880s that takes the old maid card game, which was quite common, and reimagines the old maid as a woman suffragist. So here she is with her ballot and her vote, and this is the old maid card. Now, this illustration from Harper's from about the same period shows women voting in municipal elections in the 1880s, which was happening throughout the country. Women got local votes before they got national votes. So this is Harper's with a relatively flattering uh, picture of what's actually going on in Boston where women are voting. And this is the old maid card game. And so, the game provides this visual echo of the Harper's illustration, but the voter has become an old maid and the man behind her is laughing in ridicule. So through a children's 
game, this card taught a powerful lesson. A woman could be relatively young, white, and able to afford fancy clothes, but if she ventured into politics, she risked being laughed at as an old maid. Children's books also combine traditional fairy tale representations of witches and evil stepmothers with political cartoons that showed woman suffragists wanting to wear the breeches, quote. So this circulation between tropes of older white womanhood, the witch, the old maid, and the political demands of woman suffragists worked to suggest that women did not belong in politics, and if they ventured there, they would become old, unattractive, potentially evil. Stereotyping was even worse for Black women. So the R.T. Davis Mill Company invented the advertising symbol of Aunt Jemima in the 1890s, right when women suffragists are at a peak of influence. Um, and this was when African-American women founded the National Association of Colored Women's Clubs to speak for their own interests. So Harriet Tubman spoke at the first meeting of this National Association of Colored Women, and she was hailed as, quote, Aunt Harriet, and given a platform to make her argument that white Americans old elderly black people material support. And her um, appearance generated a lot of news coverage for Tubman um, when she was older. But at the same time, Aunt Jemima Flower is selling the idea that old black women, these aunts, would ha happily serve the needs of white families rather than their own needs, cementing the mammy stereotype as a vicious caricature of older black womanhood. And I don't know if you saw it in the news, Aunt Jemima just got away with this, uh, did away with this advertising icon uh, this year. So ridiculing old women, black and white, proved remarkably tenacious. But I think that was not the only problem here. So many women themselves feared growing older. And advertisers tapped into these fears to sell patent medicines, beauty products, and clothing. And these advertisements were much more graphic than what we see for, you know, L'Oreal face stuff today. So uh, look at this advertisement for Shaker Extract of Roots with this look on this picture and on this, you know, how shall we look when we grow old? Now, men are also included in this advertising pamphlet. Um, they're trying to sell this patent medicine to men so that they won't grow old. But for women, aging is presented as catastrophic. So the headline is why she killed herself. And if you read the fine print, she killed herself because she was growing old and not taking shaker extract of roots, right? So this age anxiety could hit women remarkably young. So the text for this advertisement for Lydia Pinkham's vegetable compound reads, quote, how old I look and not yet 30. So advertisements like this were an invention of the 1880s and the 1890s when it became cheaper to print visual images in daily newspapers. And when um, th this, this set up, I think, a way of representing women's aging that is still very much with us in print culture today. So what I want to emphasize here is that the positive images of older women and the public birthday celebrations are being reported in the same newspapers that these advertisements are running in. So even as you get more positive representations of older women, you're still seeing these increasingly visual advertisements telling women that they need to look young. So by the 1910s, women suffragists themselves took up the techniques of modern advertising. And in the process, they discovered that images of young, conventionally beautiful, usually white women appealed most to white male voters. They put young white women out front, leading parades, holding pickets, beaming from magazine covers, and circulating on postcards. Now, this strategy, I think, worked remarkably well to convince male voters that they should support woman suffrage. So basically that women could vote and still be attractive to men. Uh, black women also adopted this strategy. So the Colored American magazine published in Boston circulated images of young, educated, propertied, and often light-skinned African Americans, including many young people who were supporting the women's suffrage movement. 
The magazine was edited by Pauline Hopkins, an unmarried woman in her 40s, and she wrote many articles about older Black women, including Tubman and Truth. But she recognized that putting young women on the cover was a good marketing strategy. Similarly, Carrie Chapman Catt, the president of the National American Woman Suffrage Association, was not a young woman um, in the 1910s, but she pushed younger women to the forefront of visual propaganda and spectacle. You may have heard that Catt and Alice Paul had a generational struggle, that this was a conflict between an older woman and a younger woman. But actually, they disagreed about strategy and about politics. Cat mobilized many young women, and Paul worked with old women, including some old women who went to jail for picketing the White House. Both factions pushed young, white, conventionally attractive women forward as the face of woman suffrage. So I think this idea of a generational split really misrepresents what was going on. Um, this strategy was not subtle or concealed. Uh, suffragists seek prettiest woman, the New York Herald proclaimed in October 1915, striking beauties to appear. Newspapers loved comparing the appearance of these beautiful young white women, especially those who were wealthy and frequently appeared in the society pages. So this clipping referred to the quote beauty brigade and noted that New York suffrage leaders had obtained the services of a number of the beautiful women to make appeals to voters for support on election day. And you'll note that these beautiful women now all look young, right? So the idea of trying to reclaim images of older women as leaders that could be recognized as having a kind of beauty has fallen by the wayside in, to buy into modern advertising and publicity, basically. Um, so what interests me is that women of all ages in the 1910s supported visual propaganda and spectacles that made young women the face of the women's suffrage movement. So white women erased black women, old and young, from the visual record of the movement at the same time. And this propaganda proved effective in convincing male voters to support women's suffrage. The 19th Amendment was ratified by the states 100 years ago on August 18, 1920. But it did little to convince Americans that they should vote women into higher office. So we still haven't had a female president, and we've had precious few female senators. There's much to celebrate with the recent election of more women to high office, but we're still nowhere near parity. So one part of this very complex problem, I think, is these attitudes towards older women that if we are going to see women getting elected to high office, Americans as a whole are going to have to become more comfortable with the idea of older women in power, of older women as visible, and older women as competent. So Lucretia Mott, Sojourner Truth, and other 19th century women's rights activists argued that women would never be equal to men until old women could turn ridicule into respect, gain new opportunities for public leadership, and achieve material comfort in old age. And I think these goals still remain only partially realized at best. And that is what I have for you tonight. Thank you so much, Corinne. That was great. Um, I, have a, I have a question. I'm going to turn it great. over to um, Virginia Doherty to uh, ask any questions, if people want to put their questions in the chat now. So it seems to me that we're continuing this trend with, um, you know, you have to look young. If you were a politician, you're, you have a very different standard for how you have right. to look. <laughs> right. And so would you say that's just a continuation? It's just never ended. I do think it's never ended though. I think that Nancy Pelosi is really interesting, right? And you know, she is a very powerful woman and the, you might all have noticed about 10 years ago, Republicans uh, made a major effort to ridicule Pelosi because of her age. There was the wicked witch music and, you know, all these memes going around about Pelosi as a witch, this, this old strategy. And really interestingly, other women in Congress rallied around her. And there was this really interesting moment where all these women said, look, when do you think women are going to hold political office? Um, and Hillary Clinton also weighed into her, and we could talk about how ageism counted against her. But 
I do think Pelosi's ability to hold on to power, which I'm not even saying is a good thing, right? Like there's an argument for why she shouldn't be, but I, I but I do think that it is um, showing some some shift in women pushing back against this simple strategy, um, but have yet to carry a national election, right? I mean, Pelosi's from a liberal, you know, liberal district. <laughs> Right, you know, can an older woman win national power? I don't know. <laughs> Virginia, are you here? In Virginia, you're muted, I think. Can you unmute Virginia? There you go. Okay, you got this it. Virginia Doherty, she's uh, also on our board of directors and she's gonna yeah. moderate the questions tonight. Okay, and, and uh, please put your questions in the chat. And I have a couple of questions for Professor Field. Um, one question is I have, uh, is don't you think it would help if women, if older women could get movie roles <laughs> yes <laughs> yes i do absolutely no i think hollywood is one of the um more regressive forces in our culture right now <laughs> in all sorts of ways right um i mean there are more women directors a few and mm -hmm. uh, right women uh, script screenwriters so i know it's not very many but. No, and, and a lot of them are making movies about youth, you know, um, or movies about old women with Alzheimer's or, oh, you know, some right. tragedy, which, which, I, you know, is important <laughs> to portray in film. But, you know, uh, you know, I think maybe, you know, a lot of people have talked about Grace and Frankie as a kind of breakthrough. It's a TV show. I don't know if any of you have seen it, but it um, centers on older characters that have full lives and sexualities and complications. You know, they're not there. Uh, though clearly a very elite fantasy of what a successful old age could look like, right? Um, and then a lot of people also wrote about Transparent when it was still going, which was about um, a man who transitioned to be a woman later in life, which is actually quite common. And um, that was an unusual representation. But you know, we can count on one hand the interest, right? You know, the interesting representations of older women in film. Um, so yeah, it's a huge problem. Okay, so I've got another question. Um, why did you play old maid with your children? <laughs> Honestly, it never occurred to me. I mean, it, it, you know, I'm just my bad, you know, the ways in which things that replicate, I mean, a lot of scholars have written about how racism and sexism in our society, nationalism get passed on through innocent seeming children act, children's activities. And it's like, like many people, I had a sort of separate tract of, yes, I teach in a gender studies department, but oh, let's play this classic card game that I played with my grandmother. And it wasn't until I went to the American Antiquarian Society and saw, first of all, how awful most 19th century games of old maids are. Like they're full of caricatures of women and of racial minorities and all. But then also finding that one with the suffragists, I was like, oh my gosh, you know, this is really, um, you know, a dangerous lesson that we're teaching children, you know? Um, yeah, I forbid it in my house. <laughs> my bad. Um, I, have, I have two daughters, so. <laughs> yeah. Okay, uh, let's see, we have uh, some more questions here. One question is, do you think it's even more difficult today because of the internet accessibility, social media, person, personal media vacuums? Yeah, such an interesting question. Um, and I'm not a media studies scholar, but what I know, what I've read about has more to do with race, but I think there's a similar phenomenon with age that on the one hand, the internet has enabled um, kinds of organization and connection uh, where people can very cheaply put their own representations out into the world, 
right? So, you know, like uh, black women and girls are finding all sorts of ways to represent themselves outside of mainstream media using these digital media platforms that are accessible to anyone. And that's been quite empowering in many ways as I understand it, but then on, you can't control those images once they're out there. So, you know, some of these images get taken up and repurposed for racist purposes. And then the, the big um, commercial structure of our media remains fixated on this idea that young white women represent the apex of desirability. And so they're used to sell all sorts of products. And I don't think that social media has shifted that much. Like the ads you still see selling things usually have young white women selling them, not exclusively, but usually. And that's just baked into the structure of modern advertising. Um, and I don't know how or when it shifts. It does make you, or it is interesting though, to think of um, the, the women's movement in the 1910s starting to use advertising yes. just for their benefit. I mean, yeah. and, you know, I, the, whether you agree with what they did, the, the fact that it was uh, cl a clever way to get some votes right. at that time is very interesting. And I don't right. know whether, I, I, I often feel that uh, liberal causes are not advertised properly. Yes. <laughs> so uh, we've got another question. Interesting how much attention the beautiful Gloria Steinem received and receives among women's movement activists. Yes. <laughs> yes. And I think that is um, another, I mean, Steinem, unlike some other people I think is pretty savvy about her own marketability. You know, she's spoken about that fact that she was able to get a kind of press attention that less conventionally attractive women were unable to get. Um, you know, I think what's interesting is the way people often think that Steinem founded now. <laughs> which, you know, you all know she didn't. And um, now at its founding, which I'm not a specialist in now, but I have a friend who's writing a book about the history of now, actually, which will come out in a couple of years and it'll be great. But, you know, now was a pretty um, cross-generational organization at its founding. Um, it had women of all ages. Um, but somehow Steinem's, you know, glamorous face gets associated with now. I don't know quite why. <laughs> Maybe because people know one second wave feminist and that's who they know. Um, Which is a shame when you think that we, yes. again, haven't publicized. It's really admirable the yeah. way they, uh, even though the, 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 ni the 19th century thing may not have worked, right. it was a great thing to do. Well, that, <laughs> that's sort of what I'm trying to argue with this project <laughs> is that, you know, they, <laughs> it didn't work, but we should be thinking about what might work because something about age has got to shift. Um, right. uh, we have another question. How should we fight back against young, attractive women being used to sell products? I, you know, I don't know. I mean, I think, you know, there's everything from, you know, refusing to buy um, those things and trying not to look young to, I think there's perfectly politically astute reasons to argue that it makes sense to buy into some anti-aging. And I think that's every woman's decision to make, but I would say um, it, <sighs> You know, it, it, it's also the way advertising continues to to reinforce ideas about race. You know, like I, I do think every effort we can make to encourage companies and media platforms that are showing more diverse representations of women, the better, right? You know, so to try to choose products that are doing better. Um, when you buy your shampoo or whatever. <laughs> That's really the best I can come up with. And you know, when a movie opens that has an older female character, like go opening weekend to the theater when we can all go back and the right, you know, like the these, you know, it it does help shift, I think, when things turn a profit. This is true. Uh, and someone here says, yet 
uh, Eleanor Roosevelt was popular and exerted mm -hmm. influence in her later years. Yes, absolutely. No, nope. and there have always been um, older women that are popular and who stay in the public eye, for sure. Uh, let's see, we have someone says images, uh, no Barbies. <laughs> <laughs> yes. <laughs> Gave, uh, Gave happy to be me dolls and challenged to fill out with different aged children's spouse found no grandparents. Is it, she says, is it better now? Uh, I don't know. Does anyone know if there are dolls uh, available like that? I don't, I'm not familiar with happy to be me dolls. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, American Girl dolls are more they're, they're not Barbie. <laughs> um. <laughs> okay, uh, we've got, are your students at UVA familiar with the realities of the women's suffrage movement, including hunger strikes, imprisonment, and forced feedings? Great question. Um, a lot of them know. But, um, you know, if they come to my classes where I'm teaching women's history, they're going to learn about these things. <laughs> so, you know, the, the, the students that are walking into my classes would be more interested and they would know something about the women's suffrage movement. One of the things that's really interested me in the around the centennial is what a lot of students know about the women's suffrage movement in the United States was that it was racist. And this is absolutely true. And I'm sort of thrilled that they got that lesson, but then to also try to have them understand how central black women were to the movement, how, um, you know, like you said that some of the amazing campaigns that these women did lead and how hard it was for them to accomplish the vote. Like, I think that's all been a little bit lost. And um, it's important to try to remember people remind people how hard it was to get that amendment passed and how long it took. Uh, okay, someone, Carolyn says, uh, check out the work of Rosie Rios, 43rd mm -hmm. treasurer of the United States. Oh, yes. <laughs> yes, I met her, she's fantastic, um, absolutely. And she, she says, uh, she says that she led the effort to put a portrait of a woman yes. on uh, U.S. currency. So yes. uh, I don't know this. Does anyone know the status? They were trying to get uh, Harriet Tubman on. They were. It, it's starting again. So Biden has revived that effort. Um, and I can tell you two things that were interesting about Tubman is that when that proposal came out, the internet went wild with arguments about how she was too old to put on money because uh, all the images we have of her, all the photographs are when she's older. And then there was a one photograph that recently surfaced that interestingly, she's not any older. It's about the same dating as the first photograph we had of her, but she's better lit and she's wearing fancier clothes. And frankly, she looks prettier uh, in a very conventional way. And a whole bunch of people put this image up as the one that should be on the currency. And then this, um, have you all seen the Susan B. Anthony dollar, you know, the silver dollar with Susan B. Anthony. So that's you know, the only woman we have on currency. And I was amazed to figure out in the archive that that is based on an image of her from the 1840s before she was famous. And I can tell you that through the 1930s, uh, women who were um, in the um, League of Women Voters were trying to make Susan B. Anthony's birthday a national holiday. This was a big campaign to try to get us a holiday that would honor the birthday of a woman. And they were circulating pictures of her when she was old and they'd put them in newspapers and all. And then in, there's this one moment where a woman organizing this says, I think we should try a younger picture of Susan B. Anthony this year. And they put in this earlier image and that becomes the image they circulate after that. And that's the image that's on our currency. So the way that we look at Susan B. Anthony is not how she was famous in her life. 
but at a young, it's like she had a facelift after <laughs> her death to be put on our currency. But aren't some of the men on currency old? Of course. <laughs> yes. Let's see, do we have any other questions here? Uh, here's a comment from Mary Louise. As strong, independent women, we need to be careful about our own self-criticism yeah. of our aging. Absolutely. Um, yep. <laughs> but yep. I'm not sure what you mean by Mary Louise. <laughs> would you like to uh, exact uh, expound on that a little bit? Uh, she needs to be. She's muted. Can some? There you go. I just think sometimes we buy into the idea that being old, our hair going gray, you know, right. the the physical things that happen in aging, the moving more slowly. Mm -hmm. I think we see it as a negative yeah. because we've been taught to see it as a negative and probably more for women than men. That's all. I really think sometimes we buy into it. And I, I try mm -hmm. to fight it sometimes, but I buy into that, you know, that mm -hmm. um, I don't know. It's almost uh, we're less valuable. Um, you know, you take a lot of criticism, take a lot of teasing. Um, I think mm -hmm. in this culture, there's a lot of negativity around getting older and even though I think I'm very careful about it when I feel as though somebody's being sexist, I'm not sure my antenna are up for the ageism yeah. as much as they should yeah. be. Well, we lack a language. We, 20th century feminism hasn't produced a body of theory around ageism that gives us a vocabulary to recognize all the ways that it works. You know, people in the 19th century were thinking about it in more interesting ways. Um, and I do think that's something that feminists should work towards is trying to articulate, you know, what a critical response to ageism would be both in the world and in ourselves, you know, and it's very articulate of you to say that Mary Louise, because that's part of what, you know, these women were saying in the 19th century is we can't just blame men right? Like this is something that generations of women do to themselves, you know, as well. I don't see any more questions in the chat. Yeah. Um, I think everybody should be unmuted now. And uh, I'm going to say thank you to Virginia for moderating the questions. And thank you, thank you to Corinne for that great presentation and for enlightening us a little more tonight about ageism in the 19th century to today. Um, I so appreciate you being here and we'll all give you a virtual, virtual applause. Oh, thank you. <laughs> thank you so much for having me. It's just lovely to speak to you and I wish you all the best with your work. Um, it's really wonderful that what you're all doing with now. Thank you. Take and I wanna, I wanna stay in touch and learn more about your friend who's writing the book. Yeah, I think you have to get her to time. Yeah. You try to get her to come to the Virginia Festival of the Book when her book is out and all that. that so, would be great. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. It'll I be just want to sneak in that um, you talked about Susan B. Anthony, but Sacagawea is on the gold dollar. True. Yeah. Yes. Yes. Thank you, Kathy, for reminding me of that. That is true. Great. Wonderful, you all. Thank you so much for having me.